Thomas. I am the head of the philosophy department here at York. We are delighted to see so many people here for this event, uh, representing so many diverse backgrounds. Uh, when I turned up to the philosophy department two years ago, I was a bit surprised to discover it had no political philosophers in it. Other than me. So I took the very wise decision to transfer Martin over from politics. Uh, we're very, very grateful to him for organising today. So thank you, Martin, for all the work you put into this. It's been a great success and we're very appreciative of it. Uh, while historians are pondering the importance in British history of Peter Mendelssohn, <laughs> we know he did one thing, which was impose the impact of gender on British universities. <coughs> So it seems we're rather stuck with this since it was introduced under New Labour that survived the coalition or the Conservative government. <coughs> so there's going to be impact, can it be impact of the right kind? In other words, can it be events like this uh, that do connect academics uh, with policy experts and with the public more generally? So if you have the opportunity to cite Martin's work, or Martin and Jennifer, <laughs> please do so. <laughs> then I can go back to the VC and say, <laughs> doing something impactful in the right kind of way. And I hope you all agree that this event has been impactful in the right kind of way. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, so our keynote speaker is a person who, uh, when he heard the call today for academics to leave their monkish cell and go and involve themselves in the world, well, Thad's already done that, been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Right? Uh, so Thad is a very highly respected political philosopher has made distinguished academic contributions to political philosophy in general and the nature of property and democracy in particular. But rather than rest on his academic morals, uh, Thad did decide to go and make a difference <coughs> in the community where he lives, Richmond, Virginia, uh, a very beautiful city. I recommend you visit Richmond if you have the opportunity. But a very troubled city in the way that many uh, cities in the US have a troubled history and a legacy of that in the present. So Thad is here today to be our keynote to tell us about his experiences in the Community Wealth Building Unit of the Mayor's Office uh, in the city of Richmond in Virginia. Uh, it gives me very great pleasure to welcome you to the podium. <laughs> Um, and it's been great to be here today and learn from everybody uh, who's spoken. So, um, I am going to talk about my experiences with the Office of Community Wealth Building uh, in Richmond as it's evolved really over the last, going on eight years uh, now. But, but I, I want to situate it both in some of my earlier work um, uh, uh, that helped lay the groundwork for what we've been able to do on the ground in Richmond, but also speaks like the larger takeaway messages. So, so let me start up front, in case you all, like, I'm too boring and start fall asleep, I'll give the takeaway uh, right up front. Um, I argue that part of the crisis of left and liberal parties in the United States and elsewhere has been the lack of a compelling program and policy paradigm in recent decades. Adequate to either A, meeting the practical challenges of working people's lives, or B, solving the major and many cases profoundly urgent policy questions facing our communities and indeed our civilization. I further argue that what I term community wealth building presents a compelling bottom up approach to taking meaningful action towards equality and democracy uh, at the local level. Key elements of which must be part of any compelling policy paradigm for liberal, social democrats, or socialist parties in the liberal democratic world. That's what, actually a minimal thing. I want to try to go farther. Within the American context, at least, I argue that community wealth building offers a compelling paradigm for the reorganization of larger scale policy systems. A paradigm that can at last take progressive thinking of politics beyond the lengthy shadow of the New Deal while preserving its important accomplishments. Specifically, community wealth building, unlike uh, the New Deal, centers the importance of racial uh, equity yeah, and actually, this is a tricky word. Equity probably sounds like a paleo word here. It's actually a left word in the U.S. And it may probably chairs get into that. Uh, but um, uh, racial equity and directly confronting the deep legacy 
of slavery and racial oppression is central to American history down to the present day, with, with Richmond itself being a, a, a key location in that history. Additionally, community welfare offers a different attractive answer to the question of scale. That is, how democratic governance can be achieved in a continental system that is importantly distinct from traditional New Deal thinking. And third, and what perhaps is important, is an ideal that can be and has begun to be translated into practice at the community level in the United States and numerous cities, including uh, Richmond, Cleveland, Sarah, uh, who uh, Connie referenced our work earlier, did a study of 20 community well-building cities. We're doing some flavor of this. Uh, and 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 we get into the politics of it, but actually the politics of it is easier than you might think, yeah, and, and which is reflects the crisis itself and, and the lack uh, to, to the present of compelling answers from the traditional sources. So how is it all relevant to you in the UK or Europe? You figure that out. It's not my problem. Um, uh, but 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 uh, but a minute, however, uh, I, I want to contend that aspects of community wealth building, both this program and process are crucial to the health and rehabilitation of not only local democracy, but larger scale democracy in practically any setting. So I'm going to proceed in this talk, and I'll try to move fast. I definitely have too many pages here. Um, but the first bit, I'm going to be proceed less by analytical observation than by a bit of uh, intellectual and political autobiography. So I grew up um, in North Carolina in a university town uh, of, uh, of Chapel Hill. And, and Chapel Hill was and is considered a very progressive place, uh, and certainly the most liberal locality within the state of North Carolina. I began attending public schools and elementary school in Chapel Hill in the 70s within literally the first decade of proper as opposed to token racial integration uh, of schools. And, and you know, I thought this was normal, but I understood later this is actually new. And, and there are, in retrospect, profound racialized in inequalities in the town, yet every adult I knew uh, favored civil rights, and most were politically liberal as well. So it was where North Carolina as a whole went for Ronald Reagan very handily, presidential elections 1980-84, the Democratic candidate was winning 60 to 70 percent at least of the vote in, in Chapel Hill. In the first presidential campaign, I was eligible to vote in 1988. I was an enthusiastic supporter of Jesse Jackson who had launched the first truly multiracial national presidential campaign that year, and, and his theme of the Rainbow Coalition really presaged a lot that is, has happened that's good in America in the last generation. As a college student, I was practically a full-time activist engaged in issues ranging from left local labor disputes to the first Iraq war, and began articulating what might be termed a left social democratic perspective as a columnist for weekly newspaper. And so I remember this, I was, and I, I, it took me a while, maybe like a month after being in college to realize that everybody was carrying around like a 40-point policy platform in their coat pocket. Um, but, but, but I was, just in case, you know, <laughs> the caucus fell apart and they used my run for president. I was ready to go. Um, but my mantra at the time, it was, it, it was a, a solid social democratic agenda. I, you know, I believe as a matter of morality, people should have right to quality education, to, to decent housing, to free health care, quality employment, and the right to live in a safe, decent neighborhood. And as time goes on, though, you, you begin to realize in, in a deeper sense that the reason those things aren't available in the United States uh, are not simply because the right people have not won elections. And it sort of evolved to a deeper critique uh, of capitalism, is my experience, whatever that. But really what changed my life, and, and a few people in this room, I know, <coughs> It was in 1992, first job out of college, meeting Gar Alperovitz, who's a, a towering uh, intellect, and a, a left historian and a political economist, and, and joined the staff of the Institute for Policy Studies to work for him. And, and as some of you know, he went on later to co-found the Democracy Collaborative. So his work and framework offered several powerful ideas, which I've yet to kind of get out of my head. I know, I know Joe knows what this feels like to be colonized by Gar. Brain, but yeah, but you stick with it long enough to get your own brain back. It's kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but maybe, so powerful thoughts. And first, it is that his point that the capitalism, even the modified New Deal version, fundamentally operates a mechanism for generating wider and wider inequality. Of course, Piketty's now proved this, you know, but Gar was saying this, and obviously not the only one. But that's a powerful thing for you, sort of young. You know, they don't teach you in college in the U.S. too often. Secondly, that Looking at American political history, liberalism 
had only been able to break through with significant social reform in rare moments would have been an overwhelming Democratic majority, one period obviously being the crisis around the Depression and the huge majorities uh, FDR had to work with uh, in, in the 30s, and, and the second being sort of this blip for, for Lyndon Johnson you know, in the mid-60s. And those things literally correlate to the New Deal and, 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 and the great societies for expansion of the New Deal. However, in normal political times, uh, there is little movement over, uh, towards progressive goals in the ordinary functioning of American politics. So specifically, almost all the trends progressives cared about in the 1990s, and this is obviously still true today, moving in the wrong direction in terms of greater inequality of income and wealth, greater wealth-based inequality of political influence, greater ecological destruction, and in retrospect, we can, must add, mass incarceration and, and related racial disparities actually growing in important respects now shrinking since the 70s. So the judgment you know, is that liberal politics as such were not, and I would say are not, strong enough, either in policy substance or political muscle, to significantly alter these trends. Liberalism was and is focused on making this to work better or possibly tinkering with it at the margins, yet the fundamental problem is the system itself. And a subtle point, as early as the 90s, uh, Gar predicted that there would be a future liberal revival, including a liberal president, but the next liberal presidency in Congress would be unable to shift the long-term trends of great inequality, wealth, and political influence. So he called Obama for Obama knew who he was, <laughs> right? So, so, and yet what's interesting is, is this, this is all matter-of-fact analysis, not intended to lead to pessimism, pessimism, but actually profound optimism. So, as he put it, Soviet-style socialism had proven to be deeply problematic and unattractive in the case of collapse, Yet capitalism undermined core democratic values of equality, liberty, democracy, community, and ecological sustainability. So the question to be asked is if you don't like capitalism, you don't like state of, so, don't like state of socialism, what do you want? So I think it's still a good question. And part of my work uh, with him on what he called the Good Society Project was focused on exploring theoretical to that answers that question uh, and, and helping uh, developed the, the, this prior, uh, this idea of a pluralist commonwealth that he's written about extensively, but also looking at uh, uh, the emerging literature around market socialism that was starting to come out you know, in the 1990s in a pretty serious way. Figures like, like is there, David Miller, John Romer, and, and so forth. And and my research on those theoretical questions was as simple as my first book, be extremely hard to find. So what comes next for global <laughs> for society? But I still look at that from time to time. Um, but, but even more important than the theory, although that, and I think that is important, was, was the proposition that progress towards a new system, in the American context at least, was likely to be made at the community level first, rather than emanating from Washington, D.C. National politics stalemated, and the era of large-scale liberal programs and the scope to drive community level change had passed. Communities would, in response to this rally, eventually be compelled to find new ways to solve problems. As jobs and economic development are central to local politics, this innovative problem solving would, to gain serious traction, need to focus on shoring up the economic bases of cities and towns threatened by globalization, the industrialization, and suburbanization. So central to this line of thinking is the notion to stabilize communities economically, capital, or a substantial part of it, would have to be anchored in communities. And doing so would, in turn, require paying attention to ownership. Who, who owns productive capital is directly connected to the long-term economic stability of a community. And so, again, remind you, I grew up in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, massive public university there, and anchors of talent. We never had a recession. Extremely stable place. And uh, local politics there, as I experienced it, consisted of smart, earnest people debating the public interest. And, and it wasn't about our town's going to die if we don't give our money away to some outside entity or, or if we don't agree to the threats of, of a business that plans to, to move away. And I realized only later that was a privilege. This is not how things work in most places in America. But most places, uh, especially in sort of post-industrial <coughs> settings, um, uh, are locked in uh, uh, an understandable spiral where the politician gets elected, they promise whoever voted for them, I will bring jobs, 
they, they want to get that ribbon cutting done before the next election, the easiest and most convenient thing to do is to lure a company here. And if you have an existing company that's trying to move away, you, you, you give them whatever. Because that's a terrible headline that a you know, big company has moved away. And, and so the net result from uh, a national perspective is clearly irrational because you have communities competing with, with each other to subsidize economic development that would have happened somewhere anyway. That's wasteful, but in many, many cases, it's also bad for the locality itself compared to other alternatives. And so if local politics is going to be something more than uh, a, give, a candy giveaway, then you have to have that core basis of stability. Okay. Um, and add, add the democracy piece of this uh, just a little bit, but, 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 but later. Uh, but clearly, if you're looking at local democracy as, as a place where citizens are sort of learning the habits needed to do uh, politics well on a larger scale, it, lot, local democracy has to go well, and that does require economic stability. So, you know, and, and, and conversely, you know, if we could actually have a full community employment economy, that is, very low levels of unemployment in each and every community, that would actually amount to pretty significant structural reform within capitalism. It's to the benefit of both communities, but also you know, labor more broadly. So, um, and so we went on with this analysis, but you know, all is not, again, sort of gloom and doom. Since the 60s, and, and for part of the, the social and cultural movement around the 60s, lots of things are interesting were starting to pop up in terms of community development corporations, employee ownership sector in the United States, community land trusts, uh, people trying to use public pension funds in innovative ways to, to, to support you know, uh, community economic stability, municipal ownership, okay? even some very early experiments in broadband done by rural communities in, in Kentucky, you know, places where you would not expect this stuff to necessarily uh, pop up. Lots of things have been steadily growing and, and offered a platform to build upon. So one strategy is simply to build these up using whatever policy tools are available, including especially providing access to capital. In addition, uh, the public sector itself, even in the United States, continues to stabilize communities. As you hear from Sarah, meds and ads are a huge part of uh, uh, urban economies uh, in, in, the, in the U.S. and even in places that had seen massive deindustrialization. It's like Cleveland, is, it's hard to underestimate or hard to exaggerate the, the huge scale of population and economic loss they've had, but yet the hospitals, you couldn't move them. <laughs> they were still there. Um, and so that suggests a second strategy, which is to build on the wealth you already have, to, to try to uh, uh, leverage it better by being more intentional. So this line of thinking um, was articulated in an early iteration uh, in a book uh, Gar and another scholar, David Ambrosio, did called Making a Place for Community, Local Democracy, the global era that came out in 2002. And so we made an economic case just to scratch, but we also located within a larger order claim about democracy, about community. And then the claim runs as follows. If participation, which I think I heard somebody mention this morning, um, uh, with respect to Arendt and others, if, that, if that's a central democratic value, then participation is more possible for more people at the local level than any other scale of politics. Further, in places where there's a stable economic pace, the substance of local politics can focus on higher order questions about how we are to live together. But again, uh, in many American towns and cities, that, that's simply not the case. In places marked by community economic stability, uh, one of two dyna dynamics is likely to prevail. The town may be sent into a downward spiral uh, uh, following a plant shutdown, making its problems almost literally unsolvable. Uh, and, or, or a second, that the politics get skewed towards business-friendly policies. So if we believe that larger order democracy depends in part uh, on the cultivation of democratic civic habits and meaningful participation at the local level, robust and healthy local democracy requires a stable economic base. Then, if that's all true, we must, from a democratic theory point of view, be concerned with securing the economic base of our communities to revitalize larger order democracy. Okay, this is not a way, this is, sort of saying, and, and I was sort of in dialogue with, with uh, my advisors in, in grad school at the time, Sandell and Putnam, and said, no, it's not just all about civic virtues and stop watching too much TV and stuff like that. We have to pay attention to the political economy of community and how it's been allowed to decay in the United States. 
So uh, while we're doing that, I, I was um, also doing my doctorate at Harvard. That's why I, I bumped into Martin uh, one day. We were uh, trying to teach uh, justice to uh, 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 you know, the, the esteemed undergraduates of Harvard University. And, and, and Martin O'Neill was you know, about the only uh, hardcore Kantian that was willing to uh, stand up against Sandel's Aristotelian line, but, 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 but we became fast friends. Um, and and, uh, and my, my dissertation there is actually relevant to what, what the Richmond stuff, which I'll we'll hop to as quickly as I can. But I, I wrote a, a worker critique basically about the suburban sprawl. And, and, you know, it, and, and as interested in less is sort of urban planning issue is often framed, but more as the, the sort of the larger social dynamics of how metropolitan space and political arrangements are being constructed in the United States. And so I try to show how the characteristic pattern of metropolitan development in the US, in which you have dense central cities, the high proportions of persons of color surrounded by predominantly white affluent suburbs, perpetuates uh, structuralized, structural racialized inequality that not only generates inequality, but also undermines the possibility of a policy of solidarity that could correct inequality. Yeah, and, and in fact, it's helped generate a fundamentally conservative politics that defends those inequalities down to, to the present day. Um, and, you know, and then it has you know, some bit on how it's also bad for political participation and obviously terrible for um, the environment. And yet, despite all that, it's just so, you know, we had to take seriously the fact that for all the bad things about sprawl, it's producing real benefits. People are benefiting from this, and, and, and that's why it's popular, and, and, and that's why it persists, and that's why it's been proven so difficult to undo. So Richmond, Virginia, where I moved in 2005, was until, and to a large degree still is, like a caricature of this national story. Okay. So um, the stuff about pod, property, and democracy, uh, I think I'll lay off here, we'll come to it later, you know, in, in the interest of time. Other than you know, if you're not familiar with it, the, the key concept being in our sort of Rawlsian reading of the work is that uh, democracy and justice requires an equi equitable distribution of wealth, both to keep the wealthiest from dominating politics and society, and to ensure that all citizens have the opportunity to develop their own capabilities and live substantially free lives, but basically equal respect to others, regardless of class backgrounds. And, and I will say this, and this is continuing to astonish me, the level of wealth and equality. In the United States, as such, you can redistribute one third of the wealth of the top one percent, and you would have uh, enough to give everybody fifty thousand dollars in wealth, which would be dramatic because the bottom half of the population in the United States, uh, you know, it's it's fewer than a couple thousand dollars, and the bottom twenty percent are net debtors. So this would be transformative, you know, and it's clearly economically <coughs> possible. Uh, um, you know, politically, you know. Obviously, we, we have to work on that. But, 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 <laughs> yeah, but so um, and, 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 you know, we, we'll, 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 we'll keep working on it. Right? So, um, so I, and I say all that to say that this larger argument to address fundamental inequities of wealth, power, and opportunity does ultimately require systemic change. That is, the way our institutions produce and distribute wealth and income must change. And we can debate what the ultimate goals of change should look like, and debate the institutional specifics of such change and how these. I vary by country, but ultimately we must start somewhere. And often the best only somewhere is at the local level. And the reasons why are multiple. First, uh, local democracy is an important arena for the pro practice of democracy itself, and national level democracy, particularly in larger nations, will wither and perhaps fail without uh, local habits being robust. Secondly, simply there's more space, there's more arenas to, to, to possibly play ball and try to make new things happen and try to launch new ideas. Uh, third, democratic action and change should be real to the ordinary person. <coughs> Obviously, it has to impact everyday life. So why not start where you mean to, mean to end up anyway, as opposed to going to some higher level and hoping it, it, it trickles down. You know, delivering the goods additionally at the local level, if you can do it well and show that it works, will and, and, and I think does build the case for larger order change, the higher levels of governance. And in the context of the U.S., at least, this is a flat out political observation. Cities are often, A, the places where people most neglected and hurt by the failures of the system are, are disproportionately live. 
and, and B, it contains citizens who are most interested in and welcoming new ideas with the potential to solve immediate issues, and hence C, the places where it's possible with the mixture of community organizing and political leadership to pursue bold new ideas. So that brings us to what we try, to, we try to do in Richmond. So just some context. So Richmond is in Virginia. Virginia is in the south. You know, it's right next to Washington, D.C. It's about 100 miles away. We had this thing in the 1860s called the Civil War. Um, and, and, and Richmond was the capital of the Confederacy. And, and also, importantly, uh, it was um, uh, the center of the slave trade uh, uh, in the U.S., and this, this along perhaps with New Orleans. But you've had a large percentage of African Americans in the U.S. can trace that an ancestor at least passed through Richmond at some point. So, and, and you know, there's interesting dynamics around that. There was also it was industrial slavery within the city. So you had a free black community even before the war. So after the Civil War, Richmond becomes a leader for black empowerment for a time period in, in, in Reconstruction. But obviously, if you know anything American history, that, that gets shut down by, the, the, by about 1900. Um, and, and, and many subsequent decisions in, in, in the 20th century sort of reinforce this regime of, of racialized inequality. And I'll describe a couple of them. But just as further context, the, the metropolitan area as a whole is 1.3 million people. The city is about 230,000 people. That's actually up from about 190 when I moved there. So it's the city that's, that's been growing. Uh, also important to understand, in the sense of scale, city government is completely separate from county government here. And this is not a typical arrangement in America. In most states, cities are part of a county. And so you have some possibility for tax sharing. Due to some arcane Virginia law, uh, you know, the, the, the city has complete independent services from surrounding counties. You know, and that's critical to the dynamic that, that's emerged. Uh, but the city, city government is significant, and it has an uh, $800 million budget, okay, and, 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 and three to 4,000 uh, employees. And in, in addition, the, the school system has, a, has its own budget and, and, and a similar number of employees. So, as it's well, right now, it's, it's about 50% African American, about 42, 43% white, uh, and other groups being, being the balance. Um, it has a poverty rate of 25%, and that's 34% for African Americans, and the child poverty rate uh, of 40%. And, and, and if you look at those students who actually attend uh, the school system, about 75% are classified as being economically disadvantaged. That is, they would be eligible for. for um, reduce your free school lunch. Uh, many of you may know the um, uh, Equality of Opportunity Project done by some economists at Harvard, Stanford, it's really some amazing data which they're able to um, track uh, people's income mobility over time and, and, and check and correlate that back into where they grew up. And, and so the findings from that show that Richmond is one of the worst 2% places in the United States to grow up if you're low income, in terms of your likelihood of escaping poverty. Okay. Um, and, yeah, I, that's like the end result. If you go back and see the history, it starts to make sense. So I, I noted that, that the cities are, are separate from the, from, from the county units. So we never fully integrated schools in Richmond because the, the moment we went from the uh, token integration to having a busing scheme in which all the children within the school system actually had to go to a school that would have a, a degree of, of racial integration, well, what white families did was just move a mile or two across the county lines into a different system. So this was challenged you know, in court. It went all the way to Supreme Court. This and a parallel case in, in Detroit uh, both sort of uh, validated de facto segregation as constitutional. You know, a tragic building, and you know, Thurgood Marshall, the you know, African American justice, basically said this is going to condemn uh, cities for generations, and he, he was absolutely right. And so, so Richmond was one of the test cases for that. So, this, so there's that going on. At the same time, uh, we, we did have some thriving African American neighborhoods, and they decided to run highways through them twice. Um, and, and, and it's interesting here it is that the local elite, um, it was put up to a local referendum twice, and both times defeated at the local level by voters. 
And so they, they got a state agency to take it over and do it. You know, and, and, and at the same time, they're doing that, they're creating uh, public housing communities. And, and I'll be clear that there are examples of what we call decent public housing in the United States. They're not in Richmond. Okay, it, it's stigmatized housing. It's borderline unsafe. We had an issue just last winter where the heat went out in, in, in many, many units. And, and, and there are sort of building in space heaters to keep people uh, semblance of warmth. And, and, you know, and, and the budgets for maintenance have been declining for years and years and years on the federal level. So this is not quality housing. It, it is better than nothing. And that's important to recognize because it, it's just, it's, you can't exaggerate the lack of the safety net in the United States. And, 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 and at least we, have, we, do know, we, we do know for our public housing residents that there is a measure of stability and, and there are many who would create that stability given, given the intense levels of, of poverty. Uh, so, so what happened was thriving black neighborhoods got taken down, and, and, and then people were sort of moved into public housing communities. To, to all of which, almost all of which, are in basically one corner of the city. And then on top of that, uh, no public transportation to, to provide it at the regional level. So the bus system within the city until recently did not go beyond county lines. And so you add all these things, and there's more. <laughs> Trust me, there's more. You add, add this up, and, and the result not surprising, and yet until I say this decade, um, the conversation around poverty, education, and quality was either spoken of in like tragic terms, oh how terrible that is, or palliative terms, you know, let's go have a Christmas mother drive to, to give you know money to the poor, at, at sort of that level, and, and no one was sort of saying. This is the result of our history. It's the result of our structure. We have to put all this on the table. We want to try to change any of it. So, Mayor Dwight Jones uh, uh, was elected in 2008. Uh, he was a sort of veteran politician, but also I think you know, a black Baptist minister in the social justice tradition. You know, he, you know, consider himself aligned ultimately with, with, with Martin Luther King and so forth. And you know, he wanted to do something very sincerely about poverty. And so he created a commission, and I think that was an, an important step, was he took it to the broader community and sort of saying, I'm gonna hire somebody who's gonna work for me and they're gonna solve it. He created this commission first, which is, provides space for, for me to get involved and for many other people across the community to, to get involved. And, and so I, I was on that, I chaired one of the um, policy, what the, the policy task force ended up writing the final report. And, you know, and, and looking back, there are there fights we had in every stage of this whole process. You know, but, but the initial thing was to making sure that we had sort of a structural understanding of poverty as opposed to a behavioral or cultural understanding of poverty. So there are many, many people you know, in the US who want to tell you that the issue is uh, about uh, black fathers should be more responsible or people should pull up their pants or sort of very racialized things like that, and, and, and in Richmond you hear that too. And, and it, it hasn't completely disappeared, but we were, a few of us were very, very clear, this has to be about employment and structural issues, okay? And, but at the same time, we had to like, you know, give the other side their due. We had to listen, at least acknowledge the statistics that they cited as, as, being, as being real things to th throw into the pot. Um, and, but that process went on for about a year uh, and, and a half, and we came up with basically five big policy recommendations was to ramp up workforce development to connect people to jobs, to get better quality economic development into the city, to get regional public transportation, to start redeveloping the public housing in a way that didn't displace anyone. Extremely challenging, the hardest one. And, and then, well, actually, education was challenging too. <laughs> because because it, it, Richmond is uh, one of the three worst off systems in, in Virginia in terms of educational achievement. So. Um, and then, what I think was importantly lucky, so really, the report should have come out earlier, but uh, one of the key administrators got fired in the middle of the process, and uh, which meant we can go forward as quickly as possible, but in the long run, that, that was probably a good thing, because we were able, uh, I had a sabbatical from the University of Richmond at the time, they got me in, can you help us with the report, can you help with the implementation too? And so I agreed to do that. And, and then by taking this an additional year, we brought new people to the table, and, 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 and significant in terms of 
in the community in the door, we would be established as what we call a citizens advisory board of basically regular folks, majority of whom were either lived in poverty or were working closely with people in poverty. And we said, look, we're going to develop a detailed program for action based on the recommendations of the commission. We want, we want you to review every single step of it and, and give, give us your feedback. And, and so basically it took a whole another year of planning before we even got to action steps. And this has happened in 2013. Um, also critical sort of in, in, in that time period is that we flipped the frame from anti-poverty to community welfare. And the problem with anti-poverty uh, first of all, it's negative. Yeah, yeah, but, but secondly, we knew that it was being heard as anti-poor people. Yeah, and, and, and it's true, especially in a place like Richmond, if, if you, all you cared about was making the systems look better, you could demolish public housing, buy a red bus ticket, and send them out of town. And presumably your poverty rate would go down. Okay. And, and there are some in the community who were, and probably to a degree still are, scared that's what we had in mind. So the community wealth building was to deliberately flip the frame and say, no, it's about reinvesting in people and in communities where they are. It doesn't mean the changes don't need to happen, you know, and it doesn't mean that the, the people's lives won't be affected as new investment comes in, as the gentrification comes in. But, but fundamentally, this is like sort of pro-people. And um, so that was once our origin of how we came with the office, is we, we need to have a positive frame. The second is we were coming up with proposals for action across a range of different areas, and we need a basically a coordinating entity within city government. So, so this is you know, for those of you who do public management, this is uh, sort of a, a guerrilla tactic within the city bureaucracy establishment of the office, because there is already a huge department of social services in Richmond, as in other cities, and they do things like pro process welfare checks. And, and, and make sure people have benefits. And, and, they, and, they, and they intervene in, 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 in crises and situations of child abuse. And uh, they, 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 they work to address homelessness, things of that nature. And that has its own very established culture that, frankly, is not about changing the situation, but just trying to deal with it here and now. So a set of ideas around we're going to try to change the structure of the local economy and we're going to try to empower people so they can move all the way from uh, you know, being, in some cases, $10,000 income or less a year, all the way to trying to make double poverty, which is true economic security. That's just not part of the mindset at all. So, so we made a sort of strategic judgment. Rather than <clears throat> beat our heads against the wall, we would try to start something new within city government. And, and the mayor looked at this, and he, and he got it. He's like, yeah, that's exactly what we should do. That's sort of thing new that we can sort of uh, uh, build in <coughs> new principles. So, um, so we, we recommended that um, he uh, establish an office of community wealth building to, to take responsibility for the effort as a whole. And, and he agreed to that, and they asked me to be the first director. So this happened in, in, in 2014. Okay. So, you know, then the, the well, uh, Obviously, the fun stuff starts, but, but, but yeah, it, it, it was sort of absurd, it felt absurd to like, oh, you're, you're going to give them responsible for it. basically ending poverty in, 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 in the community, but you're one person with no staff and, and basically no formal authority other than the mayor say so. So, um, and it wasn't quite as bad as that, but at times it felt that way. But, but back, I did have to like build up the thing from, from scratch. Um, but, but, but the key thing that, that was done. Uh, first of all, in the first year or two, we built up loads of partnerships. Yeah, and it was actually good because I, I didn't have my own budget. Uh, I had a minimal budget that I could directly control, but the first year I was constantly courting with others to get them to do what we sort of wanted. And, um, and in that way, I built up a lot of relationships with people inside and outside government, which really was invaluable. Later, the second thing is, thank God we had this plan. Because the plan was like, what I held myself accountable to. And, we had, and then we had the Citizens Advisory Board, those same citizens that were there from the beginning, they became a formal advisory board of the city. And I had to report to them every month, here's what's going on. And, and, and that, 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 that was important because, well, um, you know, they held me accountable, they asked really good questions. Any number of occasions they made our ideas better. They helped with implementation, you know. And, and then there were times where I had to, like, ask them for help to sort of lean on someone or other to get something done. 
Um, and, and so, so that was a, a key thing that happened. But, 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 but we also knew the clock was ticking. If we didn't make this structurally embedded city government, the whole thing would evaporate as soon as the mayor left office. And he was in a second term. He was term limited. So, so like the next move was to um, basically go to, towards formalizing it as a city agency. And, and we got that done in, in December of, of, of 2015. And, and what we said is that it's going to have two main functions. One is going to run the workforce operation of the city. And, and this is really our flagship program. So you know, in, in, in America, there's lots of job training programs. Most of them have lots of rules attached to them. They're inadequate. They're not really geared to dealing with the folks we have in Richmond in terms of the level of support that's needed to address multiple barriers. So I'm going to read you one situation that like our caseworkers deal with. It's pretty routine. So 51-year-old single mother of one. Her son is currently enrolled in middle school. He's reported to be doing well. She's currently employed, has her high school diploma, has completed one year of college. She reported that she has a mental illness diagnosis when she was being prescribed medication by her psychiatrist, but ceased to continue to take her medications or see her psychiatrist on a regular basis. She informed staff her doctor did not release her, but she stopped taking the medications, not seeing the doctor in over a year. She reported having verbal altercations when confronted with stressful situations. It's necessary that she receives quality mental health services to maintain employment, complete college. Completion of college with sister with finding living wage employment. So here's an example of someone who's there at a certain level of functionality, but they're never going to rise to a higher level to be quote unquote self sufficient without a lot of intentional support and help. And, and, and there's many, many other situations like this, and one that, you know, phenomenon in America and presumably other places, what we call the cliff effect, where as someone starts to gain in wages, they lose in public benefits. So, so, the, so the net effect you know, of working harder you know, is not necessarily apparent in, in, in their lives. So, so we kind of have a, a two-pronged strategy. One is to provide more intentional support to help people na navigate the system and where possible pay for things or, or, or get them into programs or tap into, into resources. But the second is also to document all these barriers and build the policy cases for changes at the state level and beyond to, 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 to these systems that, that impede people. Okay, so, so we took that operation at the time, it was about eight or nine people working in that unit, and their thing, besides working with people, they're also working with employers, and saying basically what jobs do you need, trying to understand uh, 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 what they're looking for so they could develop a fit wherever possible. And so you can imagine, and uh, hopefully this comes across how hard it is to even get you know, one or two families out, really out of poverty. And then I come along crazy academic and say, well, to actually change poverty in Richmond, we need to get 1,000 families out of poverty a year for 10 consecutive years. And it's true, if we do that, we'll cut poverty by 40% in Richmond. So we put that out there as the goal. And at the same time we established the office, Mayor Jones agreed to that. We also said we would do an annual report, and this is it right here, the you know, February 2018. And you can read this one online, or we can wait for months for the next one to come out. Um, and, 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 we, and we were, you know, we were strategic about doing this. We, we make we make sure it comes out. This report, where the office has to go in front of city council, stand up, say what they've done, and the mayor has to do the same thing. That, that's a legal requirement, but it's also we we timed it so it happens every year just before the budget is introduced, <laughs> so that city council will be mindful of this as, as they consider the, the budget process. So, um, yeah, I, I was given um, two years leave from the university, um, and at that time, as the time was winding down, we, we, had, we had built an initial staff, we had some cohesion about, about mission, and then there's clarity that we're both directly serving people and we're pushing for large order policy change at both the local level and at the higher level. You know, I, I basically I had the choice whether to stay on. Uh, or to step back out and, and get involved in helping the next mayor get elected. And so, so I chose the latter course. And so the current mayor is, is LeVar Stoney, who was elected in the fall of 2016, young African-American politician. I sort of jumped on board his campaign team, became his primary policy advisor. And then when he won, uh, the same night Trump was elected, it was sort of extremely surreal. But, but um, uh, and we, and we expected he was going to be in a runoff, but he won outright. And, and I was the um, transition director. 
um, and, and, and went on to, to rejoin the government as a senior policy advisor for, for, for an additional period. Um, and, and really two significant things happened because it would have been possible because he won. First of all, he proposed his initial budget to increase the office's budget of about 33%. You know, we wanted to double it, but that the most we could get was 33%. So this is one of the, the sort of the key moments, which was um, we had some people on city council who were new, and they wanted to show they weren't just going to do everything the mayor asked for. And so they voted down the money initially in round one, a provisional vote. So th then the office staff, you know, with some work in the mayor's office, I, I was working in the mayor's office at that time, basically rallied dozens of people who have actually been to the program to come down to, uh, and rally on behalf of the office. And we have one guy, James Davis, who you know, uh, had been a former drug dealer, had become a big champion uh, of what the office is doing because he'd been to the program, he, he got a job, he got multiple jobs. He came down to city council and said, this office saved my life. You know, and, and others said the, the, the similar things. And, and that created, um, the political put us on council to put the money back, uh, which they did, but it was also, so I think, an important sort of test. Because honestly, when I was in there as director previously, everything passed 9 0. We have, we have nine people on council. It was never controversial, but we knew at some point we'd get tested. So that was one big test, and we passed it. But the second is that at the same time that was going on, the state of Virginia introduced legislation based on basically a, a white paper I'd written two years earlier to create a statewide community involved building fund to basically provide a match to any locality in Richmond who, in, in the state of Virginia who was trying to um, move people out of poverty and according to sort of a systemic plan. And, you know, we originally hoped for a $10 million fund of which Richmond would get $2 million. And it, it, it worked out that we got a $7.5 million fund of which Richmond got $2 million. Mm -hmm. so, so those two things happening in the same three-month time period meant that we we were able to basically triple the scale of the office in basically one full fell swoop. And so, so the last year and a half, the, the whole operations have been ramping up. They now have, went from having one sort of what we call a career center down four, the citywide, they were at serving 150 people or so a year, and now they're up to 750 people a year. The staff, when I left it, we had about 15 internal staff, and about an additional 20. Uh, sort of alive in different programs to help fund now, it's up to about 35 in, in, in the agency staff and, and about 60, you know, in sort of, sort of the larger team. So, so there's been growth, you know, and, and, and there's always a, you know, there's, it's a balancing act. It's, you know, uh, we, the, as we grow, there was, there's going to be more and more pressure to show, okay, where your results, where your results. And even, even with more people, even more money, it's still really hard to do that because of the scale the magnitude of what we're facing. But also, we know we do have to pass the test at some point because if we don't get bigger, we're going to fail. Right? And, and, and I think what's interesting, and maybe to think about it in terms of all your context, is we were pretty intentional about setting up the community well putting was going to be a change agent within the city government. It was not intended to be just a, a state put thing. There always needs to be dynamic, there always needs to be something happening. And so, so at the next phase, I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, sort of just three more bits on this and then maybe some final thoughts. Um, is, yeah, I said a little while ago that Office Community Opening was set up as like a guerrilla operation within a city government that in some ways was already static, already its own sort of not effective but, but deeply entrenched way of working with people in poverty. So what's happened now is uh, 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 that uh, the person who came in right after me, uh, Reggie Gordon, who's a much more experienced or nonprofit leader, has been promoted to be head of all human services. So that includes the library, social services, justice services. So he's in charge of all this. So now he has like literally 800 employees under his ambit, and what he's trying to do is orient all of it around a community wealth building perspective. You know, and, and that's like a massive undertaking to, to think about. So we've gone from just being you know 10 or 15 like-minded people now trying to get this entire big organization steering, you know, in, 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 in the same direction. A second thing is, and the major thing I did for the Arstoni as a policy advisor was to basically broker uh, a cooperative arrangement with the school system. So our, our schools, they're our biggest agency, 
but they have their own independent school board. And one of our dysfunctions is that they've been all doing their own thing for a while, to everybody's frustration. And so we sort of try to reach a grand bargain with them, like, that we, in fact, we will fund you better if you tell us what you're doing. <laughs> it doesn't seem like this should be that hard, but you'd be surprised, right? And so we have this thing called the Education Compact, whereby the leaders are all now required to work together. And, and the goal is to have like one unified plan for children. And it's sort of the, the connection, the critical connection that we've tried to make, and I think it, it is starting to sink in, is, look, we're not, going to, we're not really going to improve education if the enrichment is on 15 or 40% child poverty rate. So we have to attack poverty outside of the classroom. To do that, you have to engage parents. Are you going to engage the parents? Well, if they don't have jobs or adequate job, or they feel stuck in a sort of dead inside hole, you know, you know, you're not going to get very far. So taking a true family-based holistic approach to it, in which we understand and appreciate schools' needs and needs of teachers, we also understand that with us community wealth building and other parts and rec, other sort of serving families are also equally important. And, and we, we need to have one holistic picture for, for kids in Richmond. So that's what we, we've been working to, and there has been real progress uh, uh, through this, this education uh, compact. You know, and, and, then the, and then the third thing, and we, we have had ongoing discussions about social enterprise and, and procurement uh, possibilities in, in Richmond, uh, and, and there have been frustrations on that, to be honest. But, but, but we started using the city government itself acting as, as a model maker institution. So we now have multiple city agencies that work with um, the current director of the office, is Valerie Mitchell, who's a sort of workforce expert. <coughs> Today, the agencies are going to her saying, here's what we need in the next six months. And they're training people specific for those jobs and, and, and they're starting to get them you know, in, in growing numbers. So, so that's an example of growing a, you know, an employment pipeline within uh, the school system and also for certain jobs. So, so with the city government as, as well as the school system. Okay, so you know, lots going on uh, in, in Richmond, and, and I think it's important to understand this is just one example uh, of, of, uh, of different possibilities, and, and it's flawed, and we're all aware of the flaws, and and yet I think there's enough to build on to suggest that um, a if it's possible in Richmond, it can be done in lots of other places. Uh, and, and B, that we need a lot more people to do it. So, I, I, you know, I was going to talk about community wealth building as a national policy paradigm, and I'll just skip that a little bit in the interest of time. But, but really, if you think about how to think this is scale, the, the four elements I would regard as critical are, you know, inclusive participation on the front end, those as a moral requirement, and also practically extremely helpful. Having those people sort of be part of the work from the beginning um, was enormously valuable. You know, um, and also satisfying. The second, you have to establish full goals. You know, we just said we're something about poverty vaguely and left it at that. We've had very little direction or continuity. So we came out and said we're going to cut poverty 40% in 15 years. In that sense, like a North Star for everything. You know, and, 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 and got two mayors to sort of sign on to that strategy. You know, on the, on the full goal that basically no one else has done, but we're, we're going to try to be uh, the first. You know, the third is understanding wealth holistically. So obviously financial uh, wealth uh, and you know, business ownership, individual ownership, residential ownership, but also human capital, social capital, uh, other forms. Again, it's all a piece of being important to communities and, and its residents. You know, um, you know, and then, then the last piece, and I think this gets into some of the more um, specific strategies that people like Democracy Collaborative have been practicing, is looking at economic tools to better utilize assets that are already there within the community in, in, in a more intentional way, what's a procurement strategy, what's a workforce strategy, but also looking at redoing policy systems. Yeah, and so we started this at the local level, and, and again, it's importantly, we want this at the, at, the, at the local level, we also want to push up and get change at the higher levels as well. And so like in Virginia, like what I'm thinking about now is how do we get from one city with us to be well to have 10, because if we had 10, it'll be much easier for us to go to the state legislature and get more serious change. So, you know, um, I'll just skip to like the, the last uh, paragraph, literally, um, you know, I was going to say all the stuff about Donald Trump and how terrible he was, but, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, you know that already. Um, but, 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 you know, I, I do think that um, he's called the question about whether America is going to become um, or remain a white supremacist country. 
in which uh, what's going to be mean, soon a demographic minority has monopoly on, on wealth and, and power, and then, uh, there are some people prefer that, or we become what we've never been, which is a, you know an inclusive, truly multicultural democracy. And, and so I think we have to have strategies like this, both because of the substance, but also because they were rebuilt, when we rebuilt the sense of solidarity, we've been lacking. So go back to, you know, the game, what I said about sprawl and how it pulls people apart and makes people in conservative suburbs basically not care or have to care about, about central cities. We need processes that can begin to undo that. And, and you know, this kind of work I've been describing, it's, you have to roll up your sleeves, you have to meet your neighbors, you have to build unlikely relationships and alliances. You know, and it's great, I and mean, it's deeply satisfying, you know, when you can actually pull it off, but, but it's not how most Americans live their lives. Well, Americans have to change their lives, how they probably live their lives and forget their politics. It's just uh, a rally, and, and that's, I think, some of my thinking about civil republicanism. That's a broadly civil republican point, I think. You know, but I'd also say this, you know, uh, while theory is valuable, and certainly in the case of Richmond's health guide or progress, what is most needed at this point is simply more people going out there and giving these ideas a try, you know, in more and more communities. So, yeah, virtually every stage, uh, the Richmond process, I've been astonished at how much progress can be made simply by putting ideas on the table, by uh, being willing to engage with different kinds of people, by coming to listening, by not being afraid to be bold, and by not setting a limit on what can be accomplished. I also have been uh, intensely frustrated by our shortcomings, delays, roadblocks, okay, and haunted by the fact that each delay and failure is a lost opportunity to change somebody's life or even entire neighborhoods. Life. And I know kids who've grown up in this whole period have done this, you know, and, and you think every day about things we've done that have helped and the things we could have done that have helped more, right? So that, that's why we need more and more communities that are taking this work from different starting points and different circumstances so we can learn how to do it better, more effectively, and more efficiently over time. So I'm proud that Richmond is one of those places now that challenge each of you to think about your own city or town or rural area as a potential community wealth building city, um, it can happen in Richmond, the former capital of Confederacy, now the capital of Kimi Well Building, uh, it can happen anywhere. So, show that there's massive social costs to the level of concentrated poverty and social problems we have. So I, I think it could easily show in utilitarian calculus our dollars here are going to do more net good than they would somewhere else. So I'd probably start with, with that kind of argument. If we, we have a deeper argument about sort of what it means to be a community, you know, and, 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 and the rights of communities, we could go there if we wanted to. But I think that you take something as severe poverty levels as we have in Richmond, you know, it's obscene that we don't put more dollars into it when we look at the different ways that policies are already subsidizing suburban communities, for instance. What um, engagement did you have with the business community, and what did they bring that was additional to the community wealth building process, if anything, at all? Um, that, that's a good question. So, you know, many, many um, employers work with the workforce 
center and, and actually some of the new people who come to town and sort of become, you know, as part of, we, we don't give out massive subsidies, we give out small subsidies, but sometimes we're able to say in kind, we will develop a training program to fit your needs. So we've actually gotten some pretty large businesses to come in uh, based on that kind of partnership. But, but I will say that I did have to, well, I, 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 I built basically what we were calling then a community well building consortium. And, and so I, you know, I told you about the advisory board, that was like the grassroots, if you were. This is the grass tops. So that these were like literally leaders from the universities, from the big foundations, from the Real Estate Association, which is our biggest sort of political action group, you know, and, and a couple of representatives from like the local business community. And, and I brought them in, especially at that time when we were trying to make this permanent, because I wanted to understand what we were doing and why we were important, but also I knew they could go out and lobby on its behalf in ways I would have difficult to. So I mean, you can only lobby your boss so much, but you get someone else to do it, that's fine, right? So, so, so they actually help quite a, a lot, and, and you know, and you know, and, you know this is. Uh, and I saw on Twitter, sadly, uh, Eric Owen Wright, I guess, is uh, uh, not well and, and, and is in the process of dying. You know, he is one of my heroes, and the envisioning real utopia's book. He talks about the symbiotic strategy, where there is a stages where the interests of the elites and uh, the masses can coincide because there are inefficiencies in the system and there are things are going on that don't benefit anyone. It's everybody's interest to try to fix. And I, I do think that. A lot we've done in Richmond is kind of in that space so far, you know. So later on, there may well, and, you know, and, and there any discrete decision that maybe uh, you know now not the traditional conflict, but a lot of what we're doing, you know, people understand. Yeah, be better. People have better jobs. Let's help them make that happen. Okay. Thank you. Shall we wrap things up? Okay.